This week's Halloween episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by GoDaddy.com, Netflix.com, Squarespace, and Cock and Balls. With barbecue sauce. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. It's time for your weekly dose of Technolust. I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Matt Lestock. We've got a great show for you guys today. We're talking about uh, like services, clusters, packet sniffing. Yeah, Chris Gerling's continuing his three-part segment on packet sniffing. Uh, Darren, you've got uh, big old clustering and all kind of goodies. Beowulf even. Not quite. I'm going to be showing you guys some service action. Uh, we, as always, we've got the LAN party and trivia segments. Uh, coming up as well. And we're totally rocking the, uh, the Halloween stuff and Darren got off the candy. So that was good. Yeah, we finally destroyed the 30 pound bucket of candy that was in the hallway. It wasn't pretty. There are pictures, they will never be posted online. Take a look at Snubs, she's still in a coma. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> anyway, I think it's time to go ahead and kick it off. So let's uh, go ahead and just go ahead and cut to your pre-recorded segment about services. Sounds good. So, you may find yourself administering a server and you wonder to yourself, how can I manage services easier or give somebody access to manage services on my behalf? Um, before, there was really never a really easy way to do it. Uh, today, I'm gonna show you how to create not only your custom service, your own custom services, but we're actually gonna allow you to control services via the web. Uh, using two utilities, both of which were which are free, and of course, we love free. Uh, the first utility is part of the Windows Resource Toolkit, uh, which you guys can download at Microsoft.com. Uh, links in the show notes as well. Uh, part of a 20 application package, the Resource Toolkit will allow you to create your own custom services. Now, there's a couple manual configuration things that need to happen before your service actually becomes active. But I'm gonna go ahead and show you that right now. Uh, what we're going to do is that we're actually going to create a custom service. Now, a lot of people think that creating services is a big myth and mystery and that it cannot be done. Um, it's very easy once you download the toolkit. What we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and win Windows Box. And when you download the toolkit, you're going to find uh, a new directory obviously placed in your, your system. I browse the program files. We go ahead and browse to the Windows Resource Kits and Tools. And here you'll see all the tools that the, uh, the installer installed. Um, one of those being instserve, I-N-S-T-S-R-V.exe. Uh, that is the key one. That is the one that's actually going to allow us to create a service of our own. Um, wrap your head around this for a second. Um, the command I'm going to show you is not the service that we actually want to create. It's the launcher service. There's two components to installing your own service. There's inst serve, and there's also serve any, uh, S-R-V-A-N-Y.exe. These two components will allow us to create our own custom service. Uh, however, the command I'm going to show you right now is not the service that we actually want to create. Uh, so the two components obviously being, like I said before, inst serve uh, as well as serve any. Now what I've gone ahead and done for making command easier to understand is we've gone ahead and copied serve any uh, to the root of our C drive. Uh, basically, the command is as follows. instsrv.exe or without, the name of your custom service, and then wherever the serve any, S-R-V-A-N-Y program is at on the machine, it just so happens ours happens to be in our C drive. Um, once we go ahead and run that, the service was successfully added, and that's a good sign. Now, you can't just go to the services control panel and start your service because we haven't actually defined it yet. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to open up RegEdit, um, Registry Editor for Windows. If you're not familiar with it, probably want to be careful because you could seriously bork your system. Um, when you've actually run the installer uh, and created your own service, uh, what you will see in the tree of HK Local Machine, uh, System, Current Control Set, Services, we're actually going to find Custom Service, which is what we just created via the command line. Now we can actually set up our application inside this registry key. But first we need to go ahead and 
add a entry to this. So what we're going to go ahead and do is click new and it's going to be a key. We're going to type in parameters. If I can actually get that spelled correctly. Uh, let me just double check and make sure that's correct. Yep, parameters. And we're going to create a new string being application. Now the application string is what's actually going to launch our service. So we've come down to here, new, new string value, and type an application. Simple as that. We go ahead and edit the application and we can type anything we want. My custom app. Now, when we go into the services MMC, what we should see is we should see our custom application, our custom service. So we type in custom, oh, that's not it. Custom service right here. Now, if we go to the properties of this, you'll see that the path to the executable is srvne.exe. That's good. That's, as I mentioned in the beginning, the launcher application that is going to actually launch your custom application. So like I said, wrap your head around the fact that we're not actually launching our program from the services command uh, MMC. We're actually launching the launcher service, which will then launch our program. It's confusing, I know. Don't worry, it gets easier. So now that we've actually created the custom service, let's show you how to manage that service via the web. Um, the basic reason that we went ahead and we created um, uh, or we needed to find a solution uh, so that our community members can manage our game servers. Uh, that's where this whole process came about. That's where the entire need for custom service management via the web and custom services was created. Um, if you go into, uh, for an example, our CSS server here in the parameters, you can see that we've got the application string um, and I'm running on reserve battery power. Could somebody please throw me a brick? Um, max players, 32 tick rate, so on and so forth. We now have the ability to assign users so that they can create their own custom services, or excuse me, so that they can administer our game servers for us. Community project run by the community. We also have FTP ability for them. But getting back to the services, they can start and stop the service for the game server at any time. And the tool that we actually use to do that is Panel Daemon. Now, some of you may know of Fire Daemon. Uh, Fire Daemon being the um, service control software that allows you to create, automate, whole kind of stuff with services. We don't need that. We don't need service automation. We don't need service monitoring. If somebody detects that the server is down, they have the ability to log in. But Fire Daemon has created a front end for their application, which they released as open source, Panel Daemon. Panel Daemon is a really nice piece of software that it installs as an uh, extension to IIS or Apache um, and allows you to view a list of the current running or stopped services on the box that Panel Daemon is actually installed in. Now, remember, IIS or Apache are prerequisites for installing Panel Daemon. So if you're uncomfortable with having uh, web service on your box for whatever reasons, to find another solution. Um, personally, we don't have a problem with it because IIS and Apache, they're pretty locked down nowadays, so long as you keep your box updated. Um, but here, the users can actually hack five CSS. They can see that if it's currently running, if it's not running, and if they need to, they can actually issue restarts for the application. Now, I'm not going to get into installing a basic application. You guys are obviously smart enough to do that. The prompts are very easy. Select port number, select the virtual running um, you know, uh, web application directory. Uh, ours just happens to be panel daemon. But you can name it anything that you want for you know, security by obscurity sakes. Um, File, FileZilla FTP server is currently running, start mode, local uh, system, auto, you know, it, all of this info is available via the services MMC or via the website. We can stop all the services, we can start all the services, and we can also limit, and I'll just go ahead and I'll show you guys who we actually have set up as administrators on our uh, installation. These are your community game server admins. This info is all in the, in the wiki. You already know this. But so here, 
you've got people who have access to only specific services. So when they log into Panel Daemon, these are the only services they, they see, and these are the only services that they can control. Now, it's great for granular, granular uh, security permissions. Obviously, we don't want them having complete access to the machine and all the services running on it. Not that you guys are going to do anything to it, but it allows us to make sure that we have complete control over who has control of what we normally have control over. Yeah, that makes sense. So panel daemon and serve any and in serve. All the links for the information will be in the show notes. You guys can go to hack5.org or my website, mattlestock.com. Uh, and now I think Shannon is going to rack our brains with some trivia. Shannon? All right, this week's trivia is, what vintage supercomputer was named after strings, arrays, and its speed and floating point operations per second? If you're the first one to answer this right in your choice of forum, whether it's Hack 5 or Revision 3, we'll send you not only stickers, but also a Pronobozo CD. And GoDaddy is our sponsor. Get reliable, secure web hosting without the long-term contract. GoDaddy's hosting plans are bigger and better than ever with 99% uptime, free 24-7 support, and no annual commitment. Plus, you can register a .ca domain, A. Eh? As a Hack5 viewer, you can get a 10% off code with HAK1. And now we're going to bring it over to Chris and Darren with packet sniffing. All right, here we are with the third installment of the packet sniffing extravaganza, if you will. Once again, Chris Gerling showing us how to actually get our hands dirty. We understand the high level stuff, how to put our packets together, the OSI layers. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at some packets, some actual traffic. We'll go beyond the building blocks. There we go. Uh, so we're going to focus mainly on um, the Wireshark um, program in this in this uh, segment mm -hmm. because this is just what we what I use. And, I love you know, Wireshark. Um, it's a great. Tool. So we're going to go into some of the higher level functions, not all of them, but enough to kind of get you you know a little bit more dangerous. Um, Do you want to tell us real so quick about Wireshark? What, what this basically does, and we've kind of showed it before, but we didn't really show you exactly what we were doing. Um, it will capture everything off of a given network network interface, depending on what options and filters and everything that you give it. So, by default, it just gives you the fire hose. You just get everything. You get ARP requests. You get you know who has this IP address, who has this MAC address. Who you just get everything. HTTP, UDP, no matter what it is. And and again, this is great for either debugging as a network administrator, mm -hmm. or if, if you're a man in the middle, you've got somebody flowing through a piece of fruit that you have access to, and you're <laughs> just watching everything in between. Exactly. But we don't we don't want just want to see everything. There's mm -hmm. there's stuff that we're interested in. So you've come and, and you would. Want to talk like uh, there's what IRC traffic? Yeah, That's we, what we're uh, interested in this example. Yeah, we have a IRC as an example. So I have an IRC client up uh, right here. I'm just going to minimize it really quick, and we're going to go back, and we're going to go to our interfaces here. So this is just uh, this this we're going to use this Microsoft one because it's mm -hmm. what our IP address is, and I'm just going to hit start, mm -hmm. and. Uh, now, anything you do, like if you brought up a web browser and refreshed the yeah, web page. Yeah, if I did uh, hack five and just refreshed. We're just going to get thousands of, again, there's no one big hack yep. five packet. So see how, see how small that scroll bar thing is right now? Wow. You it's, have it's, hundreds. It's, where, where is it? It's 196, 196 packets. Just 196 in, packets just, just from the web page. Great. So now we're going to, uh, I'm just going to stop that one and I'm going to restart. Okay. Just so we don't have all that stuff there. Sure. And I'm going to go into IRC here and mm -hmm. I'm going to reconnect. So I was just connected to uh, Mint IRC. Are you connecting IRC. to Mint IRC? Oh, exactly. my favorite IRC, IRC server. <laughs> so now that we're connected, I'm going to actually uh, I set up a dummy account. This is not my password. No. <laughs> really? So I'm going to message the NixServe. Uh, identify. And that's that's me. That's blah. That's my that's you my get some more dummy NixServe traffic up in there? And then we're going to, uh, yeah, we can do that. We can message NixServe yeah. uh, help. See, yeah. Help's a good one. And then I'll just do one of these random commands I see at the end here. Uh, like release. Or like, not sure. re you can't release You yourself. can't release OK, Why great. Not? All oh, right. That's fine. <laughs> so now we go back here, and we see a really tiny scroll bar again. OK. And, uh, so we have a lot of IRC traffic up in here. So now we want to actually we want to like make sense of this, because there's this with SSDP, and there's a whole bunch of just you, know, you try to scroll down and read it, and you just it's, it's, there's so much there's stuff. There's a lot of overhead, through. too. It's more than just IRC mm -hmm. like exactly. communication. So, so we need to filter mm -hmm. this. So now I'm going to stop it so I don't get any more of this in here so we can actually <laughs> work with it. So we have 164 packets. 
you know, I don't want to really go through and read 164 individual packets no, to try you. to find what I'm looking for. So what we devised is uh, there's this, uh, something you can use called capture filters and also just real-time filters in general. Display filters. Display filters. Okay. Um, and so what the we... The difference do, is... The capture filter will filter it out before... Before it displays and the yeah, display you filter you just filters. Takes what you already have, so you won't even get it if you do a capture filter. Gotcha. All right. So we are going to do IRC request. That's the actual string. It's just uh, like Boolean strings. Okay. Uh, and we're going to do contains nick serve. So, so this is going to tell us just everything that now the request is everything that the client has said. Everything as, that, as opposed that to I like sent out. Mm -hmm. So we can do both with the server. Okay, great. So if I did, uh, if if I already uh, knew maybe part of somebody's password, I can yeah. do response. Or we're just looking for responses, or like even we a username, see, like a conversation that they're having with mm -hmm. just two people. We would do a response from that person. Exactly. Okay. So now when I hit enter here, we're down to three packets. <laughs> so much easier. <laughs> and of course, IRC is so small that we don't need to worry about them being like past the MTU size and have mm -hmm. to fragment and do multiple. Yep. So what's our first packet? So our first packet is actually the identify packet, and there's the password. So <laughs> Okay, so so highlight this, because yep. I want to be able to yeah. see that on, on this. There we go. Right there at the bottom. Zero cool. Zero what cool. an inventive password. What an inventive <laughs> password. Not really. <laughs> um, that's not my password. Don't try to use it. <laughs> well, actually, go ahead. Try. Um, but uh, so, so you know, if you didn't know before, IRC, if you're not using an encrypted, you know, Totally channel, plain text. Everything is just clear text. Love So clear remember text. that when you actually, people that you have, like, usernames on IRC servers, don't use passwords that you use for important things. Do not Good use idea. your banking password. Don't you know? Just <laughs> create a password that's strong, that's but that's a whole a, you know whole but another conversation in and of itself. Exactly. I hear you. Okay, great. So we were able to filter just the next serve mm -hmm. stuff. What about highlighting and and, and getting? Okay, so we can um, go in here and right click on mm -hmm. this one, for example, and we can colorize this 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 little puppy right here. So we can just do uh, like a new coloring roll, or I can just go with the default one. I don't really feel like creating a whole new one. So now we made, so now it's kind of a different color. Right. And, and you can do this. You're colorizing rules. Yeah. In, in you can actually go here, and I'll, I'll open it up so you can you can look at it. Um, but this is where you can go through, and um, and I have this because because we we sure. have it narrowed down. But let me just cancel out of this, and you can see yeah, that. Yeah, show the one that we created. Here's the one that we created down here. IRC request contains Nick server, and that's kind of ugly, I know, but. <laughs> well, that's what you want is, is you want if you're just watching out. everything in IRC and you're just looking for Nick server mm -hmm. passwords, you want to just sit back, watch the whole stream, and when the lady in the red dress comes by, you wouldn't totally identify her. So, exactly. you know, blue and red, kind of ugly, but at least it gets your attention. It'll get your attention. So, um, all right, so, so that's colorized. Those are filters. What other fun stuff can we do with? Uh, um, we can do uh, statistics. Mm -hmm. um, there are. If you can see here, you can do statistics for just about any sort of packet po possible. I mean, it's just multicast streams, different things like that. Vo VOIP, if you were had VOIP traffic, sure. VOIP, um, you could look at that. Um, one of the nice little things that I like to do is uh, I'll pull up a summary right here, and I'll maximize that. This just gives you a general overview of what happened mm -hmm. during your conversation. So we captured 164 packets. Uh, you know, we displayed three. It just uh, tells you kind of how long. It just you know, just a really nice little quick summary of what happened. Um, if we get out of that. We can pull this up again, and I like to also pull up conversations. That's a nice ah, one that so, I like to pull up. So if you're just watching a whole lot of traffic, people are multitasking. Mm -hmm. They got instant messengers going on. They've got web browsers going on. But they exactly. maybe got some SSH session. Some other lots stuff. of different types of protocols going on at the same time. And, and we don't even know what we're looking at mm -hmm. because when you look at the fire hose, it's a mess. Mm -hmm. So you pull up this and you're like, oh, yep. here's what they're doing. Yep. And then you might find some interesting and stuff. And you can see there's a fiber channel. I mean, there's everything. It's, uh, you've got IPv6 down oh. here. You've, I mean, uh, you've got IPX. You've got token ring. Mm -hmm. So any kind of, you know, it's, it just filters it out for you. So it's really easy. This It's just nice charts for management, you know. Again, <laughs> beautiful tool, kind of a lot of information, but what we really want to do mm -hmm. is narrow down the signal and noise and, and see exactly. the good stuff. Exactly. So there's a, there's a lot more powerful things you can do. I mean, there's even a firewall ACL rule part right here where you can actually generate a Cisco IOS rule based on That's you an saw. entire segment, man. Yeah, it let is. Let me tell you. All right. <laughs> so you, of course, have so a write-up on all of this and, and how to find other resources for coming up with your Boolean strings mm -hmm. and, and your rule sets here so that you can make your own 
expressions so you can make your own filters mm -hmm. and uh, and make sure you're just seeing ladies in red dresses, right? Exactly. All right, Chris, excellent stuff as always. Sinek. Sinek <laughs> and the return. <laughs> Sweet. Yep. And let's kick it over to Shannon and see what's going with this week's land party. I know Halloween is coming up in a couple of days, and I don't know about you guys, but I'm super stoked coming from the family I come from. Up here we have a wallpaper by DigiP celebrating the Halloween thing. And if you want to add your own community wallpaper to our forums, go to the community images. And also, I wanted to tell you guys about our LAN party coming up this Saturday, November 1st. You go to game.hack5.org from the comfort of your own home. You don't have to be in Virginia, guys. You don't have to. It's okay. Join us up there, play the game, own up some noobs with me, probably, because I own. If you don't really feel like playing in the game, go to hack5.org and check us out on the set cam. But for now, we're going to toss it over to the guys to talk about Squarespace. That's right, Squarespace is sponsoring the Hack 5 LAN party, and we're excited to be working with them. It turns out they're fans of Hack 5, been watching since the infamous 1x03. Yep. Yeah, and uh, they've been awesome to us, and, and I've been checking out the software. A lot of fun to use. It's like a desktop application, but it's totally in your browser. Blurs the line there a little bit between web and desktop. Yeah, Squarespace, uh, I mean, if you guys are looking to create any kind of website or blog or list or anything of that sort, Squarespace, you need to check out. Not only do they have great publishing tools, uh, in my opinion, their tools and analytics rival Google or you know your web trends or anything like that. If you've used something in the past that's like a online publishing tool, like I don't know Google Pages, for example, you're getting the wrong idea of what publishing systems can really be like on the web. I mean, speaking of versatile, the the, the people over at Squarespace, the developers who obviously we've talked to, if if you guys are you know trying out Squarespace and you find that there's something that you don't like or you think should be added send us an email so that we can talk to them because they are super motivated in adding anything and everything that they can possibly add. Uh, I know Kevin and Sarah uh, from Revision 3 both had requests that were implemented in less than a week uh, for their personal websites. What he's trying to say is that Squarespace is basically at least four times cooler than Matt Lestock. And Indeed. we think you should check it out. In fact, one of our very own, Joe Eagle, has even uh, checked out Squarespace and put together a page about the Hack 5 Halloween LAN party. Yep. That's right. We were putting together kind of a fun Halloween LAN contest thing, and uh, that is all you need to do is on Halloween, once you're done trick-or-treating or maybe too old for that kind of stuff, head over to uh, game.hack5.org, uh, ut.hack5.org if you're into the Unreal Tournament 99, the old classics. Um, we're going to also be playing Counter-Strike, so cs.hack5.org, and Battle... Not Battlefield, I'm sorry. Uh, Team Fortress 2. Team Fortress 2, so that's tf2.hack5.org. We're going to be having so much fun game. I'm, I'm kind of like a little bit uh, on the fence as to what game I should be playing. I think I'm going to be in the UT99 server, but I'll probably also trade off with the... Uh, Team Fortress 2. I'm probably going to be destroying the Battlefield 2 server. Um, CSS really isn't my game, but in addition, if you guys have a suggestion for a LAN party, please hit us up, feedback at hack5.org, or head to the forums, or you can go to squarespace.com and sign up for a free trial, and we want you guys to create the new Hack 5 LAN party website. Uh, go to squarespace.com, sign up for your free trial, and in addition, you'll see the power and the you know capability that Squarespace really offers, and you get a feel for you know if you feel like you guys need to use it. Uh, like Darren said, WordPress is great, but having somebody ensure that your site is up 100% of the time is far better than you know yeah, getting I mean, dug just, in. Well, I mean, I, I had no idea about Squarespace when they were first approached. Just I was like, okay, what is this stuff? And I just watched the video on the homepage, and like. Bam, instantly, yeah. like within a few seconds, totally rocked it. Uh, and of course, hack5halloween.squarespace.com is where you can find Joe Eagle's page where he's put up all the details about our uh, event this Halloween, and we hope you guys will join us. So anyway, at this point, uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about clustering. So I'm going to head over to that set magically and talk with Snubs about all the fun, happy stuff you can do with clusters. So Darren has all this hardware all over the set. He's taken over the computers on the network. What the hell are you doing? Well, all the computers except for Evil Server, because oh, we don't. Thank God. Yeah, we don't want to get him on the same network as us. Cool. Um, but yeah, I wanted to use these to illustrate parallel computing, or in particular, what's that? Cluster computing. Uh, it's when you take lots of different hardware and you use it to spread the load of, of single inst instructions or tasks 
So lots of hands make for light work. So when you say hardware, are you just talking about one computer and a bunch of processes, or are you talking about multiple computers? Well, in this instance, I want to talk about cluster computing, where we use lots of individual computers, each with their own operating system that all kind of converge and work on the same problem at the same time. Uh, if we work on something simultaneously in parallel, we can do it a lot faster. So you can take like my computer and Paul's upstairs and your computer all yeah, together. Yeah, that's what we've done here. Is like I've got little working bees. Exactly, uh, lots of little worker bees. I've got okay. a uh, VIA based system here. I've got an Intel based system there, and then upstairs we have an AMD based system. And uh, we're going to put those all together and use all of the resources, hopefully efficiently, uh, with a cluster. But I also wanted to kind of touch on some of the other types of parallel computing systems there are. Um, what are those? Well, there's massively <coughs> parallel processing, which is what you would see in things like uh, like the Earth simulator or like supercomputers. Oh, yeah. OK. Well, the difference there is that all of the components kind of come together in a single machine rather than like in our cluster, where they all actually have their own resources that they have got to manage. And that sounds, uh, it sounds a little bit expensive. Yeah, this isn't Just something that you, that's not something you're going to do on a hacker budget. And then, of course, there's <laughs> grid computing, which is kind of cool. What's that? Well, uh, are you familiar with uh, folding at home? Oh, yeah. That's grid computing. Yeah, Hack5 um, has their own team on that. Yes, Hack5 has a. Uh, has a folding at home team, and you can donate your processing power when your computer's idle. It pops up a little screen saver and starts using it to like fold proteins and find a cure for cancer, something like that. And the difference there is that it's very loosely organized. It's like only your, your system resources only join the grid when they're available. You know, when you're not playing Counter Strike, you wouldn't want right. to be folding in the background. <laughs> um, and they're geographically dispersed. So that's the difference between grid computing there. Whereas a cluster would be kind of like in our house, all That's doing it cool. at the same time. Yeah. So we're not we're not curing any cancer today, are we? No. What I want to do is I want to build a Beowulf cluster. Oh, that sounds very. It's it's actually named uh, by the epic poem. Yeah, the old <laughs> English epic poem. Um, it was actually, the, the term kind of came about in 1994 when NASA built a system that's actually called the Beowulf Cluster. But then it kind of became just a general term. I think I've term. heard of that on Slashdot. <laughs> exactly, yeah, there's a Slashdot meme, like imagine a Beowulf Cluster yeah. of this land shark, you know, um, or, or whatever. Um, but it, it's become a generic term for just any cheap hardware that you can kind of throw together and build a cluster out of. So okay. that's what we're going to be doing today, and I've got some examples. Yeah, so show me what's going on on this computer. <laughs> mm. Okay, let me show you the example, and then I'll go into some of the, uh, the systems that, that use it. So what I've got here uh, booted up is an instance of, um, of Cluster Nopix. Now, Cluster Nopix is an open mosix based system, and I should probably qualify that. Yeah, please do. <laughs> sure, MOSIX is a management system for uh, providing uh, SSI, which is single system image. Okay. And it also allows for simple process migration. So first I got to explain, single system image, um, all of this hardware, this, uh, this VIA system here, that P4, the AMD upstairs, all have to run the same, uh, the same image here. Uh, in this case, it's cluster Nopix. Okay. Could be, a lot, there's lots of other different Linux distributions that do this. Uh, in this case, we're just using cluster Nopix. And uh, that's the SSI, that's the single system image. And uh, OpenMOS 6 provides both that and the process migration. And that's really where this parallel computing kind of comes into play, is that we've got m we want to take something and split it up into as many processes as possible so that we can distribute the load. I'll take a process. You can take a process. Matt can take a process. We give a process to Paul. And then all four of us get break out the Lego bricks and build a giant castle. Nice. You four get the times, work done faster. Well, uh, yeah, ho hopefully four times faster than it would be um, if we were all do it individually. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, that it's not always exactly four times. You, know? you would think, OK, so for the example of like password cracking, right? If I could crack, say, a five, five character password, uh, like we'll just say a Windows NTLM hash okay. in, uh, in like four minutes with one computer, you would think that I would be able to do it in two minutes. Two minutes for two computers, one minute for what, three computers? Four computers, yeah. Every time we double, for we would get double the efficiency. <laughs> uh, that's not exactly right. There's, there's this thing called Andal's Law, which talks about the way that the program is designed and the efficiency that uh, that's there, and it really talks about the bottlenecks of the design of the program, and it's a way for you to kind of estimate or gauge 
what um, what kind of uh, of of, um, of efficiencies you should expect for different programs when you actually do a multiprocessor or a parallel computing scenario. So are you saying that since we have different kinds of computers, different kinds of CPUs, we won't get as much efficiency as we would if we had three right, of the exact same computers? There's a lot more involved with it than just the CPU. While these are all three different systems running at, at different, uh, uh, they have different architectures because they're made by different companies. Right. They're running at different speeds. They've got different, different amounts OS. of RAM. Uh, now, now, the OS is exact, that's the SSI again. The single oh, system image, okay. they're all running Nopix Linux, or uh, Nopix, uh, oh, cluster right. Nopix right now. So that's, so at least the operating system is all the same, but their their hardware uh, differs vastly and even, you know, uh, but they're all just kind of tied together in a single network. Uh, okay. In this instance, the network is kind of the bottleneck because it's on a 100 megabit network uh, rather than the gigabit. And um, that's just because of the limitation of what we have here on the set. We've got something bigger in the closet and feel like bringing it out. But, uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, so, so that's, that's a difference there. Um, of course, it would run a lot more efficiently if we had all the same hardware. Right. But so that, that's a factor into it. It's also a factor into the way that the, whatever it is that we're doing in multiple processes is, uh, is written. So that's Andal's law. Okay. So I, I guess I'll go ahead and show you an example here okay. in Cluster Nopics. And what I have uh, loaded up here is the OpenMOSIX viewer. OpenMOSIX is a open source, uh, v uh, alternative to MOSIX, like I just explained the management system, does the SSI and the process migration. And what I'm going to load up, and you can see right in here, we've got three different machines. Right, and we've three got, different uh, IPs. There's our IPs. We can see their overall load. We can see their memory usage here. How many CPUs you Exactly. Have? We have four How CPUs in this instance over three computers because one of them the, is a dual core. So that's... That would be uh, me. Yeah. Because I'm awesome. Okay. <laughs> Except for Paul's Octo. He's got eight cores in that Mac. Oh my God, there. I know. Seriously. So um, just to show an example, and y there's many different reasons why you would want to do this. It, be it folding at home. <laughs> rendering video. That's, oh, God. <laughs> that's the one I really want to do. Because yeah. Because rendering HD video takes about seven times longer than standard yeah, a little video. bit too long. So... Yeah, it's become a little limitation here. <laughs> um, the benchmark I'm just going to show here, as an example, is password cracking. Because password oh, okay. cracking is fun, yes, right? It so is. let me go ahead and show you what I've got here. Uh, past, uh, I'm going to cat the past WD, and you can see I've got a couple of hashes here, mm -hmm. and these are just uh, NTLM hashes uh, from Windows. I just go ahead. I just went ahead and used the switchblade to pull these off of one of my machines nice. with some BS <laughs> passwords. So nothing in here is sensitive or anything, but um, but I'll go ahead and show. You here I've got my user account Ardwolf. I got my hash here, and I'm going to go ahead and run this against a password cracker. Um, and I'm just going to do a brute force attack. I'm not using any pre-computed anything, but uh, what password cracker are you using? I'm using uh, this one called. Uh, I'm going to totally mess up the name here. It's called Cecilia. 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 Oh, Sorry. okay. And the you could use something like John the Ripper. But this, uh, Cecilia, makes it really easy to split up the job into multiple processes. And then through process migration with the open MOSIX, all the processes are going to split up. And, and you'll see here, I'm just going to go ahead and run it so you can see what happens okay. in, the, in the viewer. So I'm going to go to SRC. Got the, OK, so I'm going to run this command here. It's going to uh, set to log the test file. And this part right here where I do the attack N4, that's how many processes I'm going to spawn. And this, of course, passwd is the file that I got from PW dump right. or FG dump. Um, so I'm going to split this up into four processes because, again, down here I actually have four CPUs to use um, because I've got three computers and one's a dual core. So I'll go ahead and run that. And down here you can see all oh, of a sudden. Oh wow! Look at that. So this machine's at 91% because it's doing all of it at once, and then all of a sudden it's like, wait oh, a second. Nice. And that's where the process migration it divides comes it in. up. And, and exactly, it just says, hey guys, we got a lot of crap to do here, and everybody just kind of pitches in. Um, ho if, hopefully, these would all get to 100% if mm -hmm. I was on a much faster network, of course. Right. So, got some <laughs> bottlenecks in here, but that's why I want to build something where everything is the same hardware and on a, on a very fast network. And can you want to build some... our own? Oh, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Okay, so here we go. It's already done. And you can see uh, here's user Ardwolf, password's beefy, real simple, NTLM's easy. Yeah, it's a easy. little bit easy. Well, so is I think NTLM. you should change it. I mean, that's not really my password. Yeah, <laughs> I, know. I, I use a three-character password. It's way more secure. Three characters? Well, it's oh, got yeah. it's got a dollar sign in it. 
Oh, good. Well, that's the third character. Is that the one with the No, I'm one joking. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so some of the, so I touched on open MOSIX, but there's, there's another way to do it, and that's um, MPI. That's a, that's a message passing interface. It's an API that your programs can be written for. This, there's open libraries for this in, in Python, in C, uh, Java. Different languages can use this to, um, to basically speak to all of the other computers on the network and kind of figure out their own queuing of how they're going to manage this workload. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting uh, API. It's not really based on a standard, if you will. It's become a standard in the sense that uh, it's kind of a de facto standard, but uh, there's no like it's not like 802.11, it's not like IEEE. There's no <laughs> yeah. standards body behind it that was the specification. So as such, um, just like SQL, you've got different flavors of it. So Microsoft has a cluster for Windows Server, and uh, there's lots of Linux variations that'll do this. So we're actually going to be using Pelican Linux later Ooh, to to use fun. this technology to make our own Hack Five cluster. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, and, and it sets up the SSI and all that fun stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess that's something we should probably talk about. Uh, the, the Hack 5 Beowulf cluster. Yeah, definitely. It, it's something that we are really looking for your input on because it's going to be an ongoing project here that we just want to start and, and build our own Beowulf cluster based on, uh, well, we'll kind of kick some ideas around with you guys. But we're looking for your feedback um, on what kind of operating system. Right now, we're looking at Pelican HPC. Um, and we're looking at uh, something like Intel Dual Core-ish, and uh, we'll have some specs up in my show notes, but uh, basically I want to start a dialogue on that because um, this is something that we can build and then do some segments on talking about the software, the different hardware building this, and I'm sure we can totally build it like, you know, oh. it doesn't have to even have to be in a case. It we can could, be like, amazing. Make it out of Legos or something, <laughs> be fun, yeah. Make it out of a wooden box, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Totally. So do you have anything else that you want to show us with this? No, I just really wanted to give this demonstration and cool. talk about some of the underlying technologies. This is one of these projects that I want to... I'm excited to make our own. Yeah. This is one of these projects I want to touch on some more because there's like so many different ways to do this. And I'm yeah. really interested in hearing from the audience like uh, how they think we should build this. And uh, we'll put it together and talk about the hardware and the software and everything. And, um, so where and can put they it go? to some good rather than just cracking passwords because that's kind of passe. I mean, we could do that with rainbow tables pre-computed with LT and, uh, NTLMs, <laughs> but uh, this is kind of, well, this is cool though. You could use this to generate rainbow tables. You could use it to do some folding at home. You could do uh, video rendering is one of the things I want to do with it. What's the difference between this one and rainbow tables? Well, with rainbow tables, and we've talked about rainbow tables in the past in like the second and third season, uh, but real quick, the basic idea is, is a time memory trade-off. So in the sense that okay. this ta took, what, two minutes to crack that five character password? Right. That was the time versus rainbow tables is the memory where I need 200 gigs, however many gigs, to hold a gigantic lookup table between the hashes and what they equal. Um, Didn't you do a segment on that? Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'll, I'll have links into the show notes in, in the season two and three stuff that we did on that. Um, real simple stuff. But of course, I should note that uh, this is good for salted stuff. So you could use a password right. cracker that, that can actually handle that and, and distribute the load. If you've got tons of computers just laying around your house, you know, definitely try this out. There's um, uh, Nopix, cl Cluster Nopix is kind of, it's, uh, the project has kind of been dropped. Um, in fact, so is Open Mossix, and that's why I'm looking at Pelican. Uh, but there's also some other really cool distros. This one called Chaos in particular, that's worth noting because um, it's one of these university projects that was created about uh, around the whole idea of, uh, I believe, Mossix. And what it does is it's a six megabyte uh, distribution, which is perfect if you've got one of these guys. Oh, oh God, <laughs> run. <laughs> and, uh, well, no, there's a six gig, uh, or I'm sorry, there's a six meg uh, CDFS partition on here, which you could flash it to. Huh, and okay. then it runs in memory. So you could go to the computer lab, pop it in a computer, boot off of it, and Chaos mm. uh, would boot up. And then you do it on all the machines, and what happens is it kind of ad hoc, not in like, this is kind of like a hub and spoke model thing, where it would just kind of ad hoc develop, a, um, develop links to each other in IPsec. So it's got encrypted links between each other, and that's the kind of the cool part is that's once awesome. you've got that with encrypted links, then you could technically use it on semi-trusted networks like right. a university's network. I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. advising you to do anything illegal here, but you know, you, you, if you've got a <laughs> giant corporate network that's not really doing anything at night, you could use these things to harness that kind of computing power for, for good, for evil, mostly good. 
So you're obviously going to show us how to do all this on your blog? Yeah, I've got links to lots of different arcs. I mean, I know we've run long here, but it's a lot of info. And it is. And there's a lot, lot more behind this that I find really fascinating. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys think of this and then, of course, putting together the Hack 5 Bale of Cluster. Oh, yeah. Gosh, that's so exciting. Well, thank you very much, Darren. Thank As you always. very, very much. And very now, much we're going to take a break. See ya. All right, so that just about wraps up this episode. But before we get going, I want to let you know you have to tune in to next week's episode because we've just come back from Freak Nick. I have a fun episode for you guys to check out. So next Wednesday, noon Eastern, check it out. It's going to roll. The other thing we want to let you guys know about is the stickers, which are still for sale. You guys may have noticed that we've gone to a little bit higher resolution SD. The most beautiful standard def you have ever seen, mind you. On the intro net. That's because that's how we roll. Mm -hmm. um, but however, we are not capable of releasing HD because we can't edit the HD footage yet. Turns out it's really high bit rate and our machines are just kind of choking like a euphemism that I can't use on this show. Now, if we had a Beowulf cluster of awesomeness. Yeah, that would be easier. Instead, if we had an Octo. An Octo Mac Pro. Yeah. So that's what we're currently striving for now. People may think, hey, what the hell? I, I, I thought this was it. No, we no, need no. this last component. And it, trust me, it's much cheaper than the $15,000 mixer plus a Mac Pro. We are currently this close. Yeah, we're borrowing, close. borrowing Paul's and we're trying to hook it up with a little bit more RAM. But uh, we're going to need our own Mac Pro. And until then, I mean, wow. You guys can check out hack5.org slash stickers. Remember, this close yeah definitely and you guys have independently got us to you know this beautiful SD so want to thank everybody out there in uh, in, in hack 5 land for uh, hooking us up and stickers are still available we love your support we've got more on their way more different designs on a bunch of fun stuff and look forward to uh, yeah definitely with the quickness indeed okay so I'd also like to remind you guys that Netflix is sponsoring this episode of Hack 5, and Netflix not only is awesome, but they also have uh, over 90,000 titles, including lots of Blu-ray titles, and with free shipping both ways, you can get your movies on. Let me tell you, 40 shipping centers, almost same-day delivery, or a one business day, if you will, and their plans just start at $4.99. So check them out. You can get a free, no-risk trial over at www, very important, www dot netflix.com slash hack5 and again remember the www because somebody can't figure out HD access but regardless I I've been using the Roku Netflix box for like the last oh, week yeah. annoying the crap out of the rest of the um, the hack house peoples because I've just been watching a lot of documentaries about stealth fighters and um, let's just say the X35 is awesome and poor Boeing on the joint strike fighter but still, yeah. very cool documentaries. I'll have a list of uh, my favorite stuff over at DarrenKitchen.net. And we want to thank Netflix for sponsoring this episode of Hack 5. also need to let you guys know about iFanboy, which is currently on the Revision 3 Network Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern. If you're a comp uh, comic book nerd, geek, you know, and you, you, you just love comic books, then this is the show for you. I thought I you were going to say communist. <laughs> communist? <laughs> Not so much for the communist action. <laughs> But um, comic books. Yeah, but comic books. Um, you guys can go to revision3.com slash iFanboy. And remember um, that uh, you check out their new episode with Brian Bendis, writer of the Avengers and Superman, uh, Spider-Man comics, excuse me, for Marvel Comics. And you can watch, again, iFanboy every Wednesday at noon Eastern on revision3.com. Yes, uh, Superman is, uh, is DC. Big difference there. Yeah, that... Um, yeah. That was a bad move on my part. Issue 648 for the win. Touche. Okay. And uh, for Darren and myself, we are reminding you to... Trust your tempo law. See you next week. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. This is uh, in one second. All right, and uh, you had me farting. He forces I'm, I can't out be of his the ass. only blooper boy. I can't be your blooper boy, Darren. Nope. Beep. Hey. <laughs> beep. Oh. <Hello. laughs> <laughs> I got this. Give me another beep. Welcome to security.
care of it show. <laughs> <laughs> Next episode, we will be airing all the fun, happy stuff that we've been uh, doing at Freaknik. Of course, we don't know any of that stuff right now because we were recording before Stop. them. <laughs> okay, and... We agreed we would never do that yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, we did agree that. All right, spin up our FTL, because we're about to lose. Beep. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. It's time for your... One more. <laughs> one more, one more. Do it again. <laughs>